Okay, it's just turned 11 o'clock, so we're going to get going. And welcome everyone. Thanks for turning up to this uh, webinar, which is today about the aquaponics design course. We've uh, decided to do this one purely to help people understand what's in the course and what you can expect if you decide to sign up and become one of our, our worldwide family and uh, an aquaponics practitioners or aquaponics hopefuls, depends where you are in the scheme of things. Uh, many of you are just getting started, of course, and there are some that join the course to learn stuff who have been doing aquaponics for many years. So we always have a wide range of, of students with their experience. So that's good. Okay, now I've already um, mentioned about the muting. I'll just say it again for those who've signed in late. Please keep your microphone muted at all times. Um, if you're having difficulty hearing or seeing, uh, it's a good idea to turn your camera off because that takes up more bandwidth. Although these days it seems to work fairly well anyway. Uh, that's two good things to do. Now, the idea is that you uh, ask questions as we go along. I'm happy to answer questions at any time. Um, at, during the during the discussion, it's not just all about me. So, if you want to ask a question, type it into the chat screen, and I will attempt to answer the questions as we go along. Now, don't be afraid to ask questions if you think you need to ask a question. Don't be afraid uh, that you know someone might laugh at you because that's not going to happen. We all have to start somewhere. Uh, so, ask your question. Now, before I start going through this uh, PDF that I've got loaded up, oh, thanks for the comment, Alexandra, about the hat. I have to wear it because, you know, there's nothing much up here, so you've got to keep the sun off. Um, okay, so before we get started, I'm just going to run over a few things that we commonly get asked by people just before a course starts. And, and a really common one that people, they send me an email and they say, is it possible to do it in my country? Uh, for example, uh, we've had one this morning, just this morning from a gentleman in India who gets uh, up to 35 degrees C days. Now, I think in Fahrenheit, that's about 95, something like that. Uh, and he thinks that's very hot, which it is, of course. And he's wondering, can you do it in that kind of heat? Well, the answer is yes, you can. But it's all predicated on having a good quality greenhouse or some kind of protective structure for the plants and the fish. And that's imperative. And you'll see when we, if you join the course, you'll see we do several case studies starting at week five onwards. And one of the case studies we do is a farm that was built by one of our amazing students in Oman. And of course, in Oman, the temperature there on a really hot summer day is 55 degrees C. That's about 125 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just outrageously hot. But the farm is running successfully and it's because of good farm design. Now, the opposite question is asked, of course, too. We get emails from people, for example, in Canada who say, you know, I live in Canada, it gets down to minus 20. Can I do aquaponics in my country? Well, yes, you can. But once again, it gets back to the um, a good quality greenhouse is absolutely imperative. Now, there are some parts of the world, like if you live perhaps in a nice tropical zone or a nice temperate zone, where I live, for example, in Brisbane, where our worst day is probably early in the morning, might be seven or eight degrees C, but only for an hour or two. Um, and, and our hottest day on occasions might be 40 degrees C, but that's only for one or two days. So we live in quite a moderate climate. Um, so, you know, it's not, we don't really need a green. Clicking I've just been asked by one of the office girls here, how do people get in? They have to click on the link that we sent out. If they click on the link, then you'll be able to get in. They just broadcast everywhere. It's on the Facebook page. It's on the, um, the email that was sent out. I don't know what I can do from right now. Sorry, we're in the middle of it. Yeah. So sorry if you can't get in. Um, some people are saying they've just they've been calling our office saying they can't get in. We sent out uh, links to all sorts of people. I'm sorry that you didn't get it. Don't know why. What you can do. Okay. <clears throat> when they signed up, they got an email, email confirmation from Zoom with the link in there. Yes, they did. And when you went to sign up, you would have got a, a um, you know, a link to go to to sign up. So, and we've sent out actually, um, you might be surprised, there's about thirty thousand emails. Yeah, that's right. Um, and also on our Facebook page, we had an announcement. And on our Facebook page, some of you will know we have six hundred and eleven thousand followers. So, that's that's a lot of people. And uh, we put a notice on there. So I'm sorry if people didn't get a notice. I don't know what more we can do than that. Anyway, 
here we go. Where was I up to? Okay, yes, we're talking about really cold climates. Now, really cold climates, you can do it in really cold climates. Yes, you can, but you need to have a, an appropriate greenhouse. Now, whether you subscribe to the global warming thing or not, it doesn't matter. But the buzzword today in agriculture everywhere is protected agriculture. Those two words, protected agriculture. And that means doing it under some kind of cover or not. And that's becoming more and more widespread around the world to protect your crop from unusual weather events um, that might be uh, you know, in, inhibiting you. Even where I live, where I live in a very nice mild climate in actual fact, we on occasions in springtime in particular, get thunderstorms move through and sometimes there can be hail. Uh, sometimes there can be, you know, big, really strong winds only for an hour or two, but that's enough to destroy your crop if you don't have it inside a greenhouse. And also it's not good for your fish as well. So that's the first thing. That's the first part of the answer. Can I do it where I live? Yes, you can, but you must have to be assured of success. You must have a good greenhouse. Okay. I hope that, hope that makes it clear to you. Now, yeah, Nikki says, my problem can be wind. Yeah, that's true, Nikki. A lot of people do have that wind. For example, if you live close to the coast, for example, or even some inland areas have, you know, have high winds. So once again, that's another good reason. Uh, when we get our thunderstorms come through here, one of the problems I have is flying sticks and debris, actually, because the wind is so strong that it sometimes breaks branches off trees, small ones, but just enough to you know, be a nuisance. If I, if I wasn't protected, it'd be a nuisance. <clears throat> Does the level of UV filter matter with the greenhouse? Uh, Harridan asks. No, it doesn't actually. UV is not really a problem. Plants need UV, you know, in order to grow. Uh, so, you know, if you uh, build your greenhouse well, uh, UV is not a problem. It really isn't. Um, so Habib, I'm sorry if I get your name incorrectly. Can you tell us about fees for building commercial farm of 500 square metres or 1,000 square metres with a greenhouse? Um, I'm always very reluctant to answer those questions, to be quite frank with you. And the reason is, is because around the world in different countries, costings are, are vastly different. So, you know, I could tell you a number right now and you might be very disappointed when you find out it's more or you might be pleasantly surprised when you find out it's less for you. Um, 500 square metres is a nice size. If I was building that in Australia, a 500 square metre facility in Australia, and I'll tell you, Australia is the dearest place in the world to do anything, uh, that I would have to look like spending about $150,000 for that here in Australia if I was going to do it with all new materials, you know, no secondhand materials, and, and, and employing uh, professionals to help me build it and make sure it happened properly. Now, that's going to give you the highest figure that you can imagine. In your country, if you're in India, I, I'm guessing by your name, you're somewhere in India or perhaps in Malaysia somewhere, um, you know, you'll be able to do it for much less than that. Okay, and Nikki says, I'm building one with covering, but with netting for the sides. And that's good, depending on where you live, of course. The netting is good to keep critters out. Um, you know, in some parts of the world, you have critters that want to get into your greenhouse and destroy your crop. You know, part of the idea is to keep them out. That's for sure. The enemy of a good aquaponic system is heavy rain. Because if you get heavy rain into the system, that will dilute the nutrient balance in the system and uh, cause your plants to suffer a setback, which is not good. That's if you're doing, um, if you're doing it you know, commercially. If you're doing it just for your own use, you can often suffer a bit of a, of a setback and not worry about it too much. But uh, if you're doing it commercially, every little dollar counts, so you want to have your crop protected. Nikki says she's in South Africa. That's nice. We've had a lot of students from South Africa, actually, Nikki. Welcome to the course. Okay, so let's move on and go down through here and just have a look at what's, what's in the course. And this is the PDF um, downloadable that's on our page. And our page, I'll just type it in here so that you know what it is. Just give me a moment. aquaponicsdesigncourse.com, there you go. You can click on that link if you want to go and see the page. And if you see the page, you will see this very brochure there and inviting you to download it onto your screen and have a look at it. But you don't need to do that right now because we're here uh, showing you what it's all about right now. So welcome to the Aquaponics Design Course. And we've just got a bit of an outline about me and about the, um, 
what our experience is in the length of time that we've doing, been doing aquaponics. We need to update this as 10 years, it's now 14 years, so we need to update that, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and we've opened registrations this particular time on June the 1st. We decided we'd open them early because lots of people say to us, oh, I want to register now. You know, I've got the money now, so I want to register. So uh, previously we've always held it closed until a particular time, but now it's possible to register at any time and lots of people already have. Uh, so there we go. Um, <clears throat> This question here is asked now if I'm a complete beginner. We often get people to start who have got absolutely no experience whatsoever in aquaponics or anything like it. And they wonder, will I be able to do the course? Of course you can. We start off in week one in particular, dealing with the very basics of aquaponics. You know, how does it work? What makes it work? And how do you keep it working? That all is done in week one and it flows across into week two a little bit as well. So if you're a rank beginner, you will um, get all the info you need to get you started in week one and part of week two. Now, if you're an experienced practitioner, you might think, oh, I don't want to watch that part, that's boring to me. No, it's not. We often, very, very often have people that's been, that have been doing aquaponics for five, 10 years or more who do the course because they want to uh, you know, upgrade their skills and they often send us emails and say, man, I learned stuff in week one that I didn't know before. So there's something in there for everybody, that's for sure. So, you know, you can do that. Now, what are the requirements for the course? The requirements are that you have a broadband internet connection for, that's capable of doing video streaming because all the lessons are video based. So unless you've got a reasonable um, connection, you won't be able to do the course, which is a bit difficult. Some countries of the world like Indonesia have got a Vimeo block because we host all of our videos on Vimeo, but there are ways around that. If you'd like to send us an email, we can tell you how to do that. There's a way, a simple way to get around that. So if you're in Indonesia and you want to do the course, we've had quite a number of students from um, Indonesia, you'll find, who've uh, done it quite well. So you've got a note about that down here. And there's a way to get around. Vimeo will actually tell you um, how to go about doing that. I'll just go to that just briefly uh, so that you can see Vimeo have um, some information on how to go about that. Okay. <clears throat> now, I just want to show you um, quickly inside the course and what it looks like inside. Now, this is what you'll see if you sign up and you'll go. Uh, okay, Alexandria, I'll just I'll briefly answer Alexandria's question. She says, or he says, sorry, are these lessons similar to this webinar right now where you log in at a certain time and you're speaking to us live? or these pre-recorded video sessions. They're all pre-recorded video sessions. So you can do them anytime. Whenever you want to do the lesson, whether it's midnight for you or midnight for me, it doesn't matter. You can log in and do the lessons at any time. And this is what it looks like. You'll come to week one, you'll come to the welcome page, and this is what you'll see in there. And there's a video from me welcoming you to the course. And then what the part I want you to see is, see underneath that, uh, this is from the last course that we've just finished. Students get in and ask questions, just wondering when they're going to see their grades. And you can see there, I answer the question. They're, they're emailed and the certificates are posted out, blah, blah, blah. So when the course is going on, I spend a good deal of my day and part of my evening answering student questions just exactly in this format. So that's how it happens. That was a good question. Thank you for that, Alexandria, because it's important to know that. Some people get worried and they think if they're not there on a certain time, then they'll miss out on the lesson. No, you can go over it uh, whenever you like. Now, leading on from that idea, I just want to make it clear because this is another question I've had several times just this week from people who are intending to sign up for the course. And that is, how long can I get access to the materials? Well, the answer to that is simple. You can get access to it for a minimum of 12 months. We guarantee that, that your uh, login will remain good for at least 12 months. So you can come back even after the course is over and you can re-look at any of the lessons you want to look at and ask questions. Um, just this week, I've had questions from students who did the very first course who have still got access and they uh, were students from, I think it was October 2016 course. So yes, we're not going to shut anyone off. We don't do that early, but we guarantee 12 months because you never know, the day might come when the server gets full. And so we have to start dropping off the older students from the system. 
<coughs> but we do guarantee that you'll be able to get access for at least 12 months. Mark says, is it possible to raise shrimp in this system? Yes, of course it is. But I've got to tell you, not many people do, Mark. <coughs> and I think the reason that that happens is it's not so easy raising shrimp, I think. It can cause you problems. But I've, I've got to be honest with you, I've never raised shrimp, so I can't give you much advice on that. But we know that some students do, particularly homeowners. We've not yet seen any farms built that raise shrimp. Um, they usually raise fish, regular fish. But yes, a lot of homeowners have a go at shrimp and many of them claim they do it with good success. But I can't tell you much about that, I'm sorry. Okay, looking onto the inside of the course, you can see across the top here. Now let me click on the webinars tab. I hope you can see that up there. <coughs> we click on the webinars tab and you'll see here there that we've got all the webinars every week, exactly this time actually on a Friday at 11 a.m. or whatever time it is at your place now. We run the webinar every week and which at which time it's just exactly in this format. The login is exactly the same. Everything about it is the same. And students get on there and ask questions about the lessons that were, were that were run that week. And they find out, you know, things they might, might not have fully understood or they need further explanation about. So that's when the webinar is done. Then we record those webinars. And you can see here, this is the last course. So you can see there's been week eight webinar and so on right through to week eight. So students who can't get to the record to that um, particular session often listen to the recording later on and of course many times the question that you were going to ask has been asked by some other student so that's how uh, that works let's look at what's in week one let's get week one up come on week one here we go and you can see there's more videos there and here we can look down the side here and you can see all the different video uh, topics that there are uh, for that week you know keeping it simple water flow loops uh, DWC, that stands for Deep Water Culture, Media Beds, System Components, cover all that sort of thing. Let's have a look at week two. You can see what's in week two. And here we go, hydroponics versus aquaponics. Why do we do that? Uh, decoupled systems, if you've heard about that. Let's just go down. Calculating flow rates. How do you calculate how much water has to flow through the system? And that's really important, those kind of formulas as the course goes on. <coughs> we give you all the formulas and for that kind of thing so that you can work out exactly how to run your system. Backup systems, that's a good one. We have a 13 minute lesson on that. And of course we get students asking questions about that and so on it goes. All right, and this, this particular week, here's a little trick I've got to tell you when, you when you've signed in. It's really best to do the lessons on a desktop, a laptop or a tablet. Best not to do it on your phone, even though the software is phone compatible, uh, on a phone, people have trouble seeing this kind of thing. See at the screen here, it says view more lessons. You click on that and a whole new list comes up uh, showing all the lessons. And you can see we go to the next, next page and this page is more and more of lessons. There's probably another 13 lessons in that particular week that you will miss out on if you, uh, if you have a phone. Because even though that is there on the phone, we find that people that use their telephone, their smartphone, to do the lessons often miss that particular link for some reason. I don't know why they do. So we encourage people all the time to do the lessons on your desktop, laptop or tablet and you'll get a much better result. You won't miss out on things like that. You can see at the end of week two here we have a quiz. So there's a quiz at the end of each week for you to fill in um, and, and just test your knowledge to see what you've learned for that week. So that's important to do that. Okay, I've got a couple more questions here. Do you provide a manual for the class and for references after the class? Yes, we do. Every week there's a download. We'll just go back to week one and you'll see here, um, here we go, chapter one course handbook PDF. That's it every week. Every week, next week there'll be chapter two, then chapter three and chapter four and so on. Now you're encouraged to print that up and put it into a three ring binder, you know, get a binder and punch it and put the three, put it into a three ring binder and use that during the week, the particular week. You know, that's the first thing you should do is download the course handbook for that week and put it into a, into a folder, into a binder. And then as you watch the lessons, go through and make notes because the binder actually follows the sequence of the lessons. And that way, when you finish the course, you'll have a really top class manual of the whole show. Um, in written form. So that's what you'll get at the end of it as well. So it's important to do that. And we really encourage students to be really diligent about that because as you go through the um, videos, 
you'll come up with questions or you'll find little things that you know are important and then you make a note beside that in the manual and that's that's the way you'll you'll get a good result hi i'm looking to info if we can use snakehead fish yeah of course you can use snakeheads but i believe they're a little bit a little bit tough to deal with the big teeth that are quite vicious you can use any freshwater fish in the aquaponic system but it's usually best to use a fish that is native to your area now that's that's a question we get asked a lot what fish can i use now aquaponics has to be freshwater because we're growing freshwater food plants that's what we're doing so you need to be able to raise freshwater fish and it's usually best to raise fish that are if possible native to your area because that means it's easier to get them it's going to be easier to look after them because the fish are going to be used to your climatic conditions rather than trying to raise some kind of exotic fish from far, far away that might, might require you to either heat the water or chill the water if you're going to try and raise some exotic style of fish. So it's best to try and raise one that's near you, especially when you first start off, because later on when you get quite experienced, you might choose to raise a fish that's you know not native to your area that takes a bit more looking after. That's a good question. Thanks for asking that. Uh, another one, I can see you, but I can't hear you. Well, if you can't hear me, can everyone else hear me? Can someone else put a yes in there if you can hear me, please? Yes, yes, other people can hear me, so I'm sorry. Um, Alexandri, if you can't hear me, you need to check your own speaker settings on your computer. Because look, look at all the yeses we're getting. Woohoo! So everyone can hear me. So the problem's at your end, I'm sorry. I can't help you with that. Um, It's, it is fresh water, someone says. Yes, yes, the system is run on fresh water. So snakeheads are fresh water fish, as I understand it. Uh, we don't have those in Australia, but I believe they're quite a nasty fish. They'll bite your hand off. Anyway, we've got more messages down here. Um, Billy says, I've been wanting to do this for a few years now. Super excited. I have the money for the course. How much extra cash should be needed to build out a small home aquaponics farm? Do you build during the course or afterwards? Hey, that's a really good question, Billy, because in the course, starting in week two, we actually give you plans of what we call a bathtub kit. Something that you can build at home out of two old bathtubs. So we start off with something really simple and really cheap so that you can get started doing that. Okay, then in week three, week three, uh, yes, we give you plans of what we call a pine kit, which is more elaborate, but a little bit bigger, designed for a home system and so on. And then the next time we give you another set of plans as the next week comes on for what we call an Indy 11.5 plan set, which is what we would call a medium sized home system. And so on it goes as the course progresses, we give you different plan sets and instructions on how to build progressively larger systems until of course we finally get towards the end of the system when we discuss in depth design of commercial farms. But what we try and get people to do is when you start the course, don't get too excited straight away. Don't start building anything first day. Wait till you're well into the course because your ideas may well change. As you get to week three, week four, week five, you might have different ideas by then to what you have when you first start. So I'd caution you, Billy, by all means do the course, but hang on, wait till you're into the course a few weeks before you start building anything and have a look over those plans and directions that we give you and choose something that is suitable for your particular you know, starting point and the budget that you've got to, uh, to set aside for it. <clears throat> okay, Nikki says, I have an open dam which I've stocked with tilapia. Yes, that's good, but it's not, doesn't really work all that well trying to use the dam for, your, uh, for the place to keep the fish. And the reason for that is, is because it's difficult to control the nutrient levels that the plants need in a dam. You've usually got too much water mixed with the fish, if you know what I mean. It's best to keep them in there and use the dam as your water source for the aquaponic system and perhaps catch some of the fish out of the dam and put them in a fish tank to run your aquaponic system. Okay, um, Lisa says, do you specifically give plans for building a greenhouse for the general climate types, tropics? You No, we don't give you greenhouse plans, I'm sorry. We do have lessons in week five, I think it is, about building a greenhouse and the things you should look out for when you're choosing a greenhouse. Uh, no, we don't give plans for that, but maybe we should, but it's, uh, there's such a lot of them available uh, easily online, uh, plans for greenhouses. But once again, you need to get into the lessons a little bit to discover what kind of greenhouse you possibly need and what will be best for your 
particular climatic conditions. Did you invent the idea of having fish at the same time as vegetables? No, I did not. I did not invent the idea. I wished I had it. <laughs> but no, aquaponics has been around for a very long time. We actually have some lessons in week one about um, you know, the history of aquaponics a little bit, as far as we can, uh, we can tell. But some people believe that the hanging gardens of Babylon, going way back to the time of Babylon, were probably actually early aquaponics systems. And then, of course, you've got the Incas in South America who are well known for cultivating uh, fish and plants together. So the idea is not new. It's definitely not new. But in modern times, it's caught on. And, of course, in modern times, we use modern materials and we use modern methods to make it more reliable and uh, function a lot better. Uh, so, yes, no, it's not my idea. I wish it was. Boy, if I had a patent on that. Woohoo. Um, <clears throat> uh, something that was popular before we started doing this. No, it wasn't. It wasn't really popular. Look, I'll tell you, we started doing this about 14 years ago. Um, and back then, Google was still very, very new. Young people don't understand that. They think Google's been around forever, but Google was very new then. And I remember when we first started Googling the word aquaponics and only filling one page of responses. That's the fact. Now, if you, if you Google the word aquaponics, you'll get you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of responses, you know, hundreds of pages of it. Uh, so only 14 years ago, uh, aquaponics, whilst it was around, was not very popular, but it's just taken an absolute boom in the last few years. And uh, yes, we've been, we've had a, a big influence on that, I've got, to, I've got to say, and so I've had a lot of other people uh, across the world. Um, aquaponics has really gone well in Australia and the USA, and it's particularly jumping ahead in, in India right now, and also across uh, Saudi Arabia and those places in that part of the Middle East because they have a lot of problems with food supply and also water problems. So aquaponics is really suited to places where, you know, water is a big problem and also anywhere where pure food is needed. And that's pretty much everywhere. How big of a system does one need to continually feed four people? Actually, we've got a system, a mark for that, and we call it the Indy uh, 23 plan set, which we've been selling for some time. And as far as we know, uh, we've had people build over 200 of them around the world. Very successful plan system. And we discussed that at length during the course. And we discuss how we arrived at that conclusion, what people need to feed four people. Okay, so good question. Cover that in depth. And we also give you the plans in the system, a PDF downloadable, complete plan set. And it's a really good plan set. Full color, uh, various 3D drawings, also a complete list of components you need right down to the last pipe fitting that you need to build a system. So yes, hi, Edward says, hi, in hybrid systems, is there a specific proportion formula for media beds to there? Yes, there is. There is a formula for that, but like all systems, the formula can be, you know, stretched a little bit either way. Uh, so yeah, we do talk about that at great length um, in the system about the relationship between media beds and why we believe you should have media beds in the system. We'll give you all the reasons why we believe that should happen. Okay, what about better design for a farm? Is done is dome greenhouse or other types or some template for design? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that question. You can see it there, anyone who's following the group chat. Um, as part of this course, do we get to visit any live commercial aquaponics farm in the USA or India? No, we really can't do that on an online course. Uh, we can't do that. And I know that everyone wants to visit a farm, but let me tell you something right now. Most farmers don't want visitors, quite frankly. They really don't, because it's a nuisance to their day. Their day is about getting their produce picked or planted or, or the fish fed or stuff off to market and that kind of thing. And they certainly don't want a whole lot of people turning up and saying, hi, I want to have a look around. Uh, so it's a bit difficult to organise that. But there are some farms during the course that we can point you to where you can go to and have a look. Uh, by appointment only, of course. You can't just kind of turn up and say, I want to have a look around. Uh, what's the best media bed so you don't get muck in the system? Nikki says, the best media bed is one, if you don't want to get muck in it, you have to have a filter before it in order to remove most, if not all, of the large solids. So it's all about filtration. And we talk about that at great length. Actually, we've got whole lessons that talk about nothing but filtration and various ways of doing it uh, effectively and inexpensively. 
Um, Swan says, are there certain kinds of vegetables and plants that can be planted with an aquaponic system? You can grow anything, pretty much. Anything where the crop is above the ground, and that includes flowers. If you want to grow flowers, we've had people come and do our course who are not interested in growing vegetables. They want to grow flowers, and that's fine. You can grow flowers. You can grow any kind of leafy green, uh, fruiting plants like tomatoes and, and eggplant, and on and on it goes. You can grow all sorts of things in aquaponics. There's no restriction. Actually, it's interesting you ask that because I had someone just this week send me an email saying they'd been told by somebody somewhere in internet land that you can only grow leafy green vegetables, you know, like lettuce and the like. That's just not true. <clears throat> we'll show you in our, from about week five onwards, where we show you, we do farm, uh, farm case studies. You'll see the most magnificent tomatoes being grown in aquaponics. <clears throat> and tomatoes, from a vegetable point of view, or a, they're a fruit actually, not a vegetable, but from a food plant point of view, are the most uh, nutrient demanding plant there is. So if you can grow good tomatoes, you've passed the test, you can grow anything else actually. Okay, what are the advantages of hydroponics versus just planting vegetables in your backyard and watering the plants? Wow, this is not hydroponics to start with, this is aquaponics, which is different to hydroponics. Um, well, if you've got good soil, you can plant garden in your back, garden in the back, not a problem. But you won't get a fish dinner from, <laughs> from your backyard garden. So the wonderful advantage of aquaponics is, is that you're going to get your plants grown beautifully and well, and you're going to get a fish dinner as well. So that's why a lot of people want to do it in their home. And not only that, a lot of, in fact, most parts of the world now don't have good soil anymore. You know, there's a lot of work in getting your soil remediated if you've got bad soil. A lot of soil is polluted. You know, it's full of all sorts of terrible stuff. So, you know, the main driver for aquaponics is the desire to have uh, pure food. That's what people are on about. If we are setting up, Alexandri, Alexandria asks, if we are setting up a system in a poor village, are the costs of the hydroponic system, it's aquaponics, by the way, not hydroponics, electricity and food for the fish too high for an extremely low income person to afford, afford versus the profits they'll make from selling the vegetables and the fish? That's a good question. Um, my answer to you is that it will still be profitable. Presuming they're able to sell some of the product to some people and they should be able to sell some of it off to offset their costs, which is what people do in any kind of farming, small or large. Unless you're just going to do it to provide for your own immediate family, then the cost is less than the cost, sorry, the result that you're going to get with the vegetables produced is going to be far better than the cost of production. It always is. There are many, many large, small and medium farms now operating around the world making really good profits. So, you know, okay, any system has a cost input, but so long as the, uh, the um, profit gained is greater than the input, then you're on a winner, aren't you? Mm. Uh, this question again, is the fish food expensive? Mm. Or can you just feed them bread or something? <coughs> no, the fish food's not expensive, I don't believe it is anyway. It costs you money to buy good quality fish food, and the better the quality of the fish food, the better the quality of the fish you're going to get, and the better the quality you're going to get of the plants. Because the fish food is the primary um, nutrient source into the system, because uh, we're doing two things from the one input. We buy the fish food, we feed the fish, the fish do their business in the water, and that business powers the plants. So you're actually getting two crops for the cost of the fish food. Now, if you just feed them low quality food, then you're going to get a low quality result. It still might be okay for you. That's up to you if it's for your home system. But if you're going to do this commercially for money, then you need to do it at the highest quality absolutely possible. Now, getting a lot of questions from Alexandria. Good on you, mate. Is the fish food expensive? No, I don't believe so, but you'll have to inquire locally what it is. It's actually a very low input, in fact. Uh, electricity and fish food is a low input. Fish don't eat much. They actually don't eat much. Now, there's a thing called FCR, which we discuss at length in the lessons, and that's called food conversion ratio. Now, fish are the most, um, they are the most efficient planet, sorry, I'll start again. They are the most efficient animal on the planet at converting food to body weight. And most fish have an FCR of about 1.5. Now, what that means is if you put 1.5 kilos or pounds, it doesn't matter, of food into the fish tank, and the food is all consumed, 
then the weight of the fish in that system will increase by one, one pound or one kilo. So you follow what I mean? 1.5 of food produces one kilo of actual body weight. Now that's fantastic. I think chickens are about, an FCR of about nine. You've got to have nine kilos of food to produce one kilo of chicken. So fish are the most efficient animal on the planet by far. So your fish food co cost, think of it that way, is going to return you some really good uh, fish. Okay, where are we up to now? Awesome. I grow flowers. Yeah, that's swan. You can grow flowers. Yeah, most, most farms concentrate on growing uh, veggies. That's true. Um, the flower market, I don't know how profitable it is. I don't know much about it, but most grow veggies. Edward says, hi again. Another question. Would it be necessary to introduce additional nutrients to the plants or can all the required nutrients come from the fish waste? No, you do have to have some nutrient addition and that's usually in the form of compost tea or seaweed extract, things like that, because we like to run our systems completely organic. We don't add any chemicals that might be obtained from, let's say, a hydroponic supply store. We don't like to add those kind of things because one, they're expensive, and two, we just don't like doing that. So we teach you at length in the system how to obtain those nutrient, extra nutrients that might be um, short uh, not coming through the fish food. Okay. Uh, another question. Can you feed your fish without using pellets? Well, some of these pellets are actually made of dead animals and pig grounds. No, we don't use those kind of fish pellets. Um, those kind of pellets are usually fed to other pigs, actually. Um, it's, it's quite easy, actually, around the world to obtain fish food in the form of pellets that comes only from being made from fish um, Fish offcuts, for example, when fish are caught, ocean fish are caught and they're processed, you know, and they take fillets or fillets off them, then you've got the skeleton, the head and the gut and all that sort of thing. And that is what is cooked up. It's cooked and dried and turned into fish meal. And the fish meal is what goes into the fish food. And usually there's uh, fish food also has uh, flour in the form of either soy flour or wheat flour or corn flour or something like that that goes into the thing. Now, some of you might be wondering, oh, what about GMOs? It's very easy to obtain uh, fish food that has got no GMOs and has um, got fish, um, fish meal in it only and no other dreadful things. That sort of information can be easily obtained from a fish food manufacturer. Okay. I built a filter system to the one you showed in your free videos uh, to filter my dam, which runs from a solar pump. Yeah, good, Nikki. That's, that's right. Yeah, we've shown quite a bit of, I, I gather you've been looking at our, um, um, our videos on murrayhallam.com. So some of you who have not been there, I'll just tell you now where to go. We have free videos right there that you can go and have a look. That must be what Nikki's been looking at. Yep, yeah, good. We'll see a new video every week. If a greenhouse is important to keep all the bugs out, how do we go as far as pollination is concerned? The, the primary reason for the greenhouse is not to keep the bugs out. The primary reason is to keep the bad weather away from your stuff, to protect your, your plants and your fish from, you know, heavy rain, hail, wind, and all that kind of thing. Uh, in the course we go, at, we talk to you at length about how to control the bugs, and uh, you can see how we can do that very, very well and do it organically. So all that's covered in the lesson. Can fresh fish guts from the market be fed instead of pellets? Oh, you could, but I wouldn't like to do that. You need to cook it, really, because we want to make sure that there's no bad things in the, in the, in the fish guts. Do you know what I mean? We, we're, always, we're always very concerned to make sure we keep everything clean and, and, and you know, really good. Uh, you could do it, but I wouldn't like to do it, to be honest with you. I'd be more inclined if I was able to get that stuff cheaply. I'd want to cook it up and uh, grind it up and turn it into a you know, into a fish food in that way. Okay. So there you go. Lots of good questions there. Okay. Let's have a, just have a quick run through now, more back to the lessons. Let's just go jump through to, let's say, let's have a look at week seven and you'll see what's in week seven. Here we go at the top of the page here again, introduction to week seven. And the, there we go. There's the handbook again. You click on that and you'll be able to download the handbook. And on and on it goes. Here we're talking about commercial nutrient density. How do you do that? Horticultural lighting. Do you need lighting? If so, how do you go about it? Growing under lights, what's it really like? What are the costs involved? And we actually take you to a commercial farm 
in that particular case where we went to in, uh, in America and we filmed a farm that's being run entirely under lights. And so we've got a lot of good case studies like that. Um, we've got a lengthy interview here with a commercial designer, Arvind, one of my students actually, who's now building, I think right now, his 15th or 16th farm for a client's and right now in Sri Lanka. Right now, he's just there right now building that. And you'll see lots of stuff uh, from Arvind and the farms he's built. So it's really, really good um, stuff you'll find there in the course. Now, more questions here from Billy. Will you be discuss discussing growing lights, growing outside in a greenhouse versus inside under LEDs? Yes, we will. Uh, we discussed that at length. Then. And the general answer is don't grow under lights unless you really, really have to because you add a lot of expense to what you're doing. Uh, the moment you go out buying lights and you're going to run lights, unless you live in a place like, say, in Canada, or let's say Northern Europe somewhere, where you have very, very long winters uh, that are quite dark, you would not want to grow under lights. Uh, that's what we'll tell you. We'll show you how to do it, tell you how to do it. But that's my advice from day one, is try to avoid that if you can. Especially if you want to do it for money, you'll find it adds a whole lot of cost to what you're doing. We did a trial some time ago on feeding veggie scraps to one group of fish and another group of Did you see any good results? Yes, that was a great, uh, a great test, actually. That was nearly two years ago now we did that. The, the short answer to that one is, yes, it worked out quite well. What we did, we had two tanks, which were all running on the same water in the same system. So we had identical water conditions for the plants. We put 60 fish in one tank and 60 fish in another tank as baby fish, little tiny fellows. And we fed one tank on commercially available fish pellets and the other tank of fish were fed on vegetable matter. Now, these fish are, were called silver perch, they're an Australian native perch, sorry, not silver perch, jade perch, an Australian native fish uh, that is, you know, wants to, be, wants to eat vegetable matter, that's its natural food. And at the end of the 12 months, we found that the uh, tank of fish that had been fed on the vegetable matter were on average about 10 to 15% lighter, that's less weight put on, than the fish fed on the pellets, but the fish that were fed on the vegetable matter were very healthy. And in fact, when we um, you know, processed some of them, we found they actually had less body fat. Uh, the meat on them was really of top quality. So the answer to that is yes, you can feed the fish, we discovered, and we've proved you can feed your fish on vegetable matter only. If they're, if they're a type of fish that eat that, that is, there's some fish that won't, like for example, trout or barramundi, they need other things other than so yes, it worked very well. That's the long and the short of that answer. Can a family in a village feed the fish with something from the market or do they need to buy specialised fish food from a fish food supplier? Y yes, you could, you could fish them on stuff. You could feed them on stuff out of the market. Now, particularly if you're using tilapia or carp, tilapia or carp really do well on, on vegetable matter and things like that. So you could do that. You might not experience the same um, vibrant growth in the plants, I don't know, but it would still be very good. You could do that, yes. You could do that. Um, what about minced red worms? Yeah, you can feed them red worms. Why bother mincing them? Just put them in there, let them go. There's not a fish on the planet that doesn't know how to, doesn't know how to eat a worm. So, you know, just throw the worms in there and you'll see what happens. The fish know what to do with worms. They don't need any lessons whatsoever on that. Okay, well, we've covered pretty much everything, I think. Unless you've got some more questions. Um, been nice. We've had 36 people on board for most of the time, which is nice. And I'd just like to encourage you to go along and register for the course because that's the reason we've done this today is to answer any questions you might have that might, um, might encourage you to go and do the course. Now, the cost of the course is $997 US. Alexandria's asked that question there. Um, that's the price of the course. And I'd like you to go to, see up here, up here in the top right hand corner, we have a thing called, oh no, I'm inside the course, I'm in the wrong place. When you go to the front end of the course, when you go to aquaponicsdesigncourse.com, you'll see a part there where we've got uh, testimonials. And if you've got any doubt about the value of the course, go there and you'll find that we've got well over 200 uh, very positive testimonials in there from past students. And they almost without exception say, once they've been into the course for four or five weeks, they say, if I'd have known it was going to be this good, I've been happy to pay much, much more. So we've got no doubt whatsoever that the course is full value. Uh, Calvin says, any discounts? Well, yes, there are. The course is already discounted. 
We've been running the course for that price now for over two years. And uh, if we were to take the advice of many of our students, we would have put the price up a lot more by now. But we're holding at that price. And um, honestly, when you get in there, uh, unless you're one in 1,000 or one in 2,000, uh, you will think the course is definitely worth uh, what we're charging for it. You know, we've had to charge for it because we have to recoup costs and we have to make a living just like everybody else. And, um, you know, we have to charge that to, to make the course work. Um, have we done a six month installment plan? No, but we do a four month installment plan before the next course. Uh, pretty soon that will go live in a couple of weeks time. We can pay off over four months um, when we decide on the next course, if we're going to do one that is. Yep. Mm. Yes, um, how do we, someone says, how do we get the bonus DVDs in the fiberglass tank course? The bonus DVDs are inside the course. You'll get in there, we have a part we call, uh, jokingly, Murray's Shorts. And we have a whole lot of short videos that we've done over a period of time. We also have the DVDs that we've been selling for years and years and years. You can download, sorry, not download, but you can watch them live within the course. And the fiberglass tank course comes live, that switches on automatically in week eight. So when you get to week eight of the course, you'll also see there the access to the, um, to the fiberglass tank course. And people really love that too. Actually, we've had a lot of people sign up just for that only and they say it's really good value. How can you reach me to talk to me privately? You can send me an email. And um, you know, you can do that, Joseph. What do you want to talk about? Privately. Your marriage or something, I don't know. Anyway, let's just bring you double at A-Q-U-A-P-O-N-I-C-S dot N-E-T dot A-U. There's my email address. You can send me an email if you want to do that. Any retake of the class, free or for a charge. I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean, Calvin. Any retake of the class free or for a charge? What do you mean by that? I'm sorry, I don't understand that question. Uh, Calvin, if you could be a bit more specifically. Okay, Ken uh, Vivo asks, can this course help us in starting a commercial aquaponics farm from designing the farm for the particular climate, guiding us for daily tasks and profitability of the farm? Of course, Vivo, that's exactly what this course is all about. Leading you to the point where you can design your own aquaponics farm. Now, <clears throat> that's a good question I got asked. I should have covered that earlier. What about ongoing help? Now, if you get, if you, you finish the course, you decide you want to build an aquaponics farm. Okay, you start your design process and you need some help from me. Yes, of course. We can give you help and guide you along the way. As I said earlier, I'm still answering questions from people who did the course over two years ago who chime in every now and again, they log in and they ask a question because they're partway through their project, they want to know some little thing, and we're happy to answer that. But if it gets to a full design process, for example, you want me to produce plans for you and bills of a bill of quantities and all that kind of thing, then obviously we have to charge for that. Okay, yeah, sorry, I'm not real good at saying those names, Vivo. I'm sorry if I did, didn't say your name correctly. Um, Sorry, now Calvin asked any retake on the class. I'm not sure what you mean, Calvin. Okay, I want to retake the class again in a year or two. Um, you'll still be able to log in, my friend. Just log in. As I've just said, the people that have done the course over two years ago are still logging in and asking questions and doing the lessons over again. So there you go. You, you'll have no problem with that, mate. Um, as I said, we haven't switched anyone off yet and we don't intend to. The only time we would is if the server gets full up, just gets full up with students and we can't, then of course we'd switch off some of the older students and we'd go from there. <clears throat> can you tell us more about submissions of designs and certification? Yes, we can. Okay, NM asked that question. Good question. Uh, in week eight, when you finally get to week eight, then we have instructions on what we expect for your submission. And we'd like to see you do a plan, draw a plan, and give a submission. We give you all the details there. Uh, now it can be for a home system, or it can be for a farm. And what we are asking you to do is to demonstrate that by doing the course, you understand all the process that's involved in designing an aquaponic system. So that's why we ask you to do that. Because if you, if we're going to give you a significant, a good certificate to say, you know, we believe you're an aquaponics designer, we want to be able to know that you can actually design something. So, you know, we have students put in uh, some, they do quite elaborate drawings, you know, on, on quite um, 
uh, you know, professional drawing programs and they do it to that, to that level. That's fine. I love seeing those. We also get some people who can't do that kind of thing. So they do a nice, neat um, pencil drawn system. And of course, the submission, the type submission with it, uh, telling us how they intend to go about the process, uh, how they're going to build the thing, um, how they've had discussions with the customer, for example, or with their family about the requirements they want and so on. So it's not a difficult thing to do. And we, I can tell you, almost all our students submit, almost all our students get a certificate. Sometimes we look at some and we say, sorry, you'll have to do it again. Or these are the areas where you didn't quite get it right. Uh, so you need to redo that part. We want to help you to get to the end and to be able to come out of this as an aquaponics designer, because that's what we want to see. We want to see around the world successful aquaponic designers like Arvind, who's one of my star students. You'll see stuff from Arvind in there and other students as well who've done magnificently well. In week eight, we feature a farm in South Korea where two guys did the call. They went off and built a farm. And man, when we went up there and filmed it, we've got some great film in week eight to look at, went to that farm. They were at that time, their turnover, their sales were 1.25 million US dollars a month. Now that is a big farm. And they're students of mine. How proud am I? Uh, really smart guys doing a great job. So there you are. That's, that's where we go. Um, there you are. I hope that answered that question. What size would you say would be the smallest possible commercial farm? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, depends on your, you know, many people start with an ND23 system and they double it up. We actually show you that, how to double it up in the course. We call that a twindy, which is two ND23 side by side. And we also talk about what is the definition of a commercial farm? You know, what is it? What is a commercial farm? It's, it's a farm where you're selling stuff and you're making a profit. That's what it is. So it can be whatever that needs to be at your place. There's really no way I can tell you what the answer to that is because it's like saying to me, how big should my house be? I don't know. Um, it can be any size, really. It can be, you know, typically the big farms are usually about an acre in size. That's a big farm. And the small ones can be as much as as small as two to 3,000 square feet. For the Americans, that's about 300 square metres for the rest of the world. And that's a good size farm that a mum and dad, which is typically small farms, are run by a husband and wife team, that they can do that and run it and make a nice living. You're not going to become a millionaire, but you'll make a nice living and have a great lifestyle doing something that's really good for you and good for the planet. Is there anything like Google SketchUp that we should check into and learn before we get to that point in the course? Google SketchUp is a good one. Lots of people do that. We use it here when we do farm designs for people. And it's not really that hard to learn, but don't sweat over that, Billy. You don't have to do it like that. I'm happy to accept a design that's pencil drawn. As long as it's neat, of course, and doesn't look like a chook scratches out. Um, a pencil drawn one is great. So don't be afraid to to do the pencil one, but if you want to learn Google SketchUp, go for it. If I can do it, mate, you can do it, I can assure you. Um, <clears throat> Shoan says, when would be the next duration of the course if I'm not able to join the course this time? Um, probably about October, probably. Not sure, we haven't set a date yet, uh, but probably around about October. Do we discuss about solar panels? Yes, we do. We talk about solar panels in the course for sure. I think that's in week six and uh, we talk about the pros and cons of solar panels and how you can set them up and how you can't. In fact, in one of the farms that we feature, which is in Bangalore, India, they have a big solar panel array to run their farm off. And we show that in one of the, um, in one of the course, um, what's the word, case studies, uh, so that you can see how to do that. <clears throat> yes, well, we discuss about solar panels. Yes, we do, and I think I've answered that. Okay, we seem to have come to the end of the questions pretty much. And I think we'll call it quits there. So I'll just put in here again, I'll type in again, HTTP. Sorry, I'm a boy, I can only do one thing at a time. So there you go, there's the place to go to register for the course. And I really encourage you to do it. If you've got a, you know, a deep desire to learn about aquaponics and learn it well and learn it properly. And I can say without fear of any contradiction, genuine contradiction that is, that the stuff we teach you is absolutely the latest, supported by science 
and best trade practice that you can find anywhere in the world. So you're learning from the best. If you're not really convinced of that, go to the aquaponicsdesigncourse.com um, and have a look up on the top right hand side and you'll see what our students say. And you can sit down if you want to read over 200, I think, I think we've got 270 in there now, I'm not quite sure how many in there, of students who've given us feedback saying how great the course is and how much they appreciate it. So we're certainly not afraid to be able to be questioned on how good our course is because we know that it's the best there is. Okay. Time is a problem. Hey, Kevin, don't worry about that. Everybody's got no time. We've all got the same problem. Uh, that's why you can get up and do the lessons in the middle of the night if you want to, or in the morning before you go to work or when you get home. And uh, you, can, you can get the way through it. And, you know, some people, we've had one or two students actually, that in the middle of the course, they've suffered, a, a, you know, a terrible health problem and they've had to defer doing the course. Remember, you've got guaranteed access for 12 months. And if you just send me an email and say, hey, mate, I've run into a problem, I've lost my job or, or whatever, then, you know, you can get an extension. The other thing I've got to tell you to sign up. Uh, if within seven days of starting the course that you think you don't like it, okay, it's not for me. To give you an absolute ironclad guarantee, money back, no questions asked, no problem. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming today. It's been really great. And uh, we'll see you inside the course. Okay, bye for now.